earlier this week, we had our fun with Love Exposure, but today we're delving into the bleak, bizarro sister film to that project, 2012's Himizu. Today's film is available in the United States from Olive Films, while in the United Kingdom it has been released by purveyors of all things Shion Sono, Third Window Films. There's a lot to talk about with this one, so let's not dilly-dally, and let's jump right in to Himizu. Himizu is based on the manga of the same name by Minoru Furia, which ran for 43 chapters between 2001 and 2002. The basic plot of both projects is the same, concerning a 15-year-old named Sumida, who comes from an abusive and neglectful household. His father is a degenerate gambler and a drunk, while his mother spends most of the film's runtime off-screen, leaving Sumida to his own devices at the family's boathouse. A girl at school, Keiko, has taken a strong but juvenile liking to Sumida, going so far as to plaster her bedroom walls with phrases he has uttered in class. As it turns out, she finds something of a kindred spirit in Sumida, given that her own parents are equally as abusive as his. Seeking some shared ground, Keiko moves into the boathouse and does her best to make the business viable. All the while, a group of newly homeless citizens, displaced by the disasters of March 11th and El occupy the grass outside the boathouse. They do their best to get by, forming an emotional support network for one another, as well as for Sumida and Keiko. Things turn sour, however, once a group of Yakuza show up to collect an outstanding debt from Sumida's father. This sparks a series of events that, were they not so bleak, could almost be called a comedy of errors concerning the homeless Sumida, Keiko, and the Yakuza as the adults try to maintain their lifestyles and the children try to find purpose in their adolescent lives. As we said up front, Himizu acts something like a mirror world version of love exposure. For starters, the basic romantic plot is an inversion of that in the earlier film. Love Exposure saw Yu Honda infatuated with Yoko, with this love serving as his reasoning for rescuing her from the clutches of a cult, an external group. Himizu, by contrast, sees Keiko romantically interested in Sumida, with her childish love pushing her to attempt to save him from his own mental illness and depression. In other words, from himself. Throughout the film, several visual cues crop up to remind us of Love Exposure, like the extended monologue that Yoko gives on the beach during the third act of Love Exposure being reflected in Keiko's extended monologue during Himizu's climax. The former is filled with rage and determination, while the latter is driven by sadness and uncertainty, though the framing of both is nearly identical. What's more, where the final action scene of Love Exposure involves Yu taking down a large number of cult goons in a fantastical fight involving blood hoses and swords, Himizu includes a sequence where Sumida takes on an entire Yakuza clan using only a blade. And although this altercation ends up with Sumida's death, we then learn that this is a fantasy, though it is far from fantastical. On that note, the violence of Himizu is perhaps the most striking contrast with Love Exposure, if not with all of Shion Sono's more recent filmography. Usually, Sono and longtime collaborator Yoshihiro Nishimura, who has provided special effects for most of Sono's hits, are given to borderline gratuitous violence and gore. With Himizu, however, almost no blood is used and gore is nowhere to be seen. This is not one of Sono's signature hyperbolic pictures, but as gritty and realistic a portrait of violence and its physiological effects as he can muster. And damn, it's effective. Where films like Love Exposure were partially fabricated from real-world experiences, Himizu has an undercurrent of true horror embedded in its very fiber. The original manga, of course, was about 10 years old by the time the film was shot, but current events precipitated some major changes for the project. Sono stated in an interview with Electric Sheep magazine that the manga is actually more depressing than his film, given that it was written during a time of relative peace. He seems to think that the manga's handling of the story's heavy themes comes from a place of imagination on the part of the author, while the 2012 film was released less than a year following March 11th, 2011, meaning that Sono could rely on these recent events to help tell his version of Himizu. As we've discussed before, this day saw the destruction, death, and displacement of more people and property than Japan had seen in quite some time, making it one of the most widely emotionally rattling disasters ever. As Sono puts it, quote, Now we're not living in a peaceful time. We're not secure enough to show these depressing things. That's why it changed. End quote. 
These events resulted in the political commentary seen with the children's teacher at school, who pontificates on how each of the students is an individual in the face of these tough times. The homeless, of course, play into this as well, discussing how they were wealthy individuals, one of them even being a company president, who lost everything in a single day. And that's to say nothing of the dream sequences sprinkled throughout the film in which Sumida and the people occupying his lawn wander through the desolation of March 11th. Kimizu was shot mostly only three months after the disasters, meaning that what you're seeing right now is not a set, but the actual not yet cleaned destruction. Through all of these references to March 11th, 2011, we see the first two major interpretations of the film. In this reading, Sumida and the mental struggle he undergoes through the course of the film represent the Japanese populace at large following that fateful day. He's angered by the neglect of his parents, or the government, as well as his teacher who speaks well of aiding those hurt, but who does nothing concrete. The veritable disaster that Sumida sees his life to be is thus a parallel for the seemingly senseless troubles of 2011, and what many have criticized as the insufficient responses on the part of the government. Rather than face the harsh reality of his life, he seeks to escape through physically running away from school, and in trying to lash out at anyone he sees as an aggressor to the innocence of the world. Thus, through Himizu, Sono could be implying that the people of Japan need to have faith that things will improve, and to push for positive change rather than being reactive and hurting others. The other interpretation, which simply redirects all of this evidence, the teacher, the parents, the lashing out, is that Himizu is a statement on mental health, and more specifically depression. Sumida, in all of his misanthropy and violent acts, never displays symptoms of sociopathy. He shows that he has empathy for others, but that he is under a profound amount of stress and in constant mental pain. We could compare the rampage at the height of the film quite easily with one of Sono's earlier projects, Hazard. In that film, we follow a young transplant from Japan to New York who doesn't speak but a few words of English. Throughout the course of that film, we witness how American society pushes him down time and again until he reaches a breaking point. Swap Sumida's blade of choice for a pistol, and the climax of either film is similar, but not identical. Where Hazard concludes on a fairly neutral, ambiguous note following the main character's breakdown, Kimizu wraps up on a positive note with the implication that good changes are on the horizon for Sumida. While Hazard explains why this character has a breakdown, Himizu drops us right in the middle of the story, with Sumida having already suffered years of abuse from his parents. What's more, we experience Sumida's world solely through his actions and words, without the aid of his inner thoughts to clarify his intentions. This means that we see the effects of the abuse from his parents, but must glean the causes on our own. Thus, meeting Sumida is like meeting a teenager in a major depressive episode, where we might be willing to simply write him off as a misguided youth who is ultimately selfish. And while we might be somewhat right in this assessment, the more important aspect in the case of Himizu is that Sumida displays that he has the ability to change, to come out of his depression. Thus, while this might apply on a meta level to the people of Japan at large, it's the personal level that makes Himizu relatable for audiences worldwide. In some ways, Sumida starts out as similar to Holden Caulfield, the protagonist of J.D. Salinger's classic The Catcher in the Rye. That book, which follows Caulfield's journey and thoughts as he trapezes around New York following expulsion from boarding school, has long been popular among teenagers and much maligned among their teachers. Speak to just about anybody who read it as a teenager, then again as an adult, and you'll find a common through line in critical appraisal. Teenagers relate to Caulfield while adults find him miserable. Like Sumida, his inner monologue largely concerns his want to better the world by protecting the innocents, a fairly selfish, messiah-like thought in and of itself. However, unlike Sumida, Caulfield's journey doesn't end with any sort of real arc, but rather with the sense that the world will never change, and that perhaps Caulfield is destined to remain morose and misanthropic. Sumida, meanwhile, is another story. 
Sumita is initially inspired to quit school after being told time and again by his teacher that each of the students is special. He tells them all to dream big, and then to go out and attain their dreams. Defiantly, Sumita shouts that normal is the way to be, and that he aspires to nothing more than taking over the family boathouse. He is thus seen as stagnant and defiant for the sake of being defiant. This rejection of his teacher's positive attitude serves to display Sumita's depression. He feels isolated and consequentially wants to isolate himself physically. However, Keiko aptly sees something in Sumita. She tries desperately to support him, no matter how abusive he might become towards her. He's only known abuse and he doesn't know how to accept her positivity, meaning that the only action he can think to take is to give her the abuse he has received. Keiko does not lose heart, however, and during the climax of the film, she confronts him about his mental state, telling him that he's simply sick, and that if he can push through, she knows he can get better. If any of you viewers have been through a major depressive episode and come out of it, you probably understand how fake that sounds when you're in the throes of depression, but also how true it remains once you come through on the other side. Where Holden Caulfield never shows a real want to change his ways, Sumita actually does have this fundamental shift, making Himizu a more relatable story. Sumita is imbued with the striking paradox of depression that he feels isolated and thus wants to isolate himself physically, but that he also wants attention. He is lonely and doesn't want to be, and, not knowing how to handle the kindness of others, exemplifies the old adage that misery loves company. The final sequence of the film sees Keiko encouraging Sumita to turn himself in to the police for the crimes he has committed during the latter half of the film, namely killing his father after being pushed too far then attempting to stab others in public. He finally sees that killing is not the way to solve his problems, nor that he can take on the burden of all the world's innocence, and the film ends with the couple running presumably to the police. It's a hopeful ending, both on a personal level and on a national level with Sono effectively saying that both the depressed person and the Japanese public must push forward to get through the tough times. More importantly, everyone who wants to see it through needs to want to get through, as no one can be helped who doesn't want to be. And on that note, we ought to talk about the elephant in the room. We don't usually get political on this show. Heck, we don't usually even give personal opinions on the films we cover favoring as objective of analysis and coverage as possible, but I did not feel like we could cover Himizu without bringing this up. Given all the political turmoil in America over the past decade or so, it should be no surprise that some of the tragedies that have occurred here have been linked in some way or another to pieces of media. Unfortunately, Himizu is just one of those pieces of media, being claimed as the favorite film of Dylan Roof. The mass murderer who killed nine churchgoers in Charleston, South Carolina on April 17, 2015. In the manifesto he published online before the attack, he quoted Sumita's monologue from the film where he expresses his want to help the innocents of the world. Naturally, once this manifesto came to light, numerous news outlets put the magnifying glass to Himizu, questioning whether Roof was inspired by the film or whether he was merely using its rhetoric to fuel his pre-existing desires for destruction. Others even stated that Shion Sono more or less owed it to the victims of Roof's massacre and to the public to make a statement and to claim some amount of responsibility for Roof's crimes. In the wake of a tragedy like this, it's only natural that people will look for a cause. In a twisted way, this almost feeds into the interpretation of the film related to the Japanese public and March 11th, 2011. In these types of incidents, we should grieve for those lost but we should also move forward in a healthy way, rather than bottling our anger and taking it out in a destructive manner. Dylan Roof did not understand Himizu, just as he didn't understand American History X. In both cases, he cherry-picked the rage-fueled monologues of each film's characters early in their arcs, ignoring the senseless destruction that came from both of these cases, not to mention the character development later on. I see this shit going on and I don't see anybody doing anything about it, and it fucking pisses me off! In the case of the Columbia, South Carolina shooting, it might seem silly for me to bring up the potential defaming that Roof did to his quote-unquote favorite movie. In fact, this is not my intent with this entire aside. By now, criticism of the film to this end has died down more or less entirely. Just like with March 11th, 2011, I mean to say that we should recall who and what was lost in Roof's 2015 shooting and we should learn from it. 
Roof, like Sumida at his worst point in Himizu, and like Holden Caulfield in Catcher in the Rye, was severely misguided, living in a fantasy world where he could ignore the endings to some of his favorite movies. He thought he could emulate the earlier moments in these films without having to live out their repercussions. In fact, the film shows that no matter how reprehensible the personalities and actions of the adult characters in the film might be, they're all more or less resigned to who they are. While Sumida's fundamental problem could be argued to be his lack of identity, Sumida is a remarkably childish character for the better part of the film, and without his character development at the film's conclusion, Himizu wouldn't be the film that it is, both emotionally and metaphorically. And that's precisely why it's such a moving project, because it bears to everyone, the depressed and the steady emotion alike, some very raw truths about how we should and shouldn't deal with the world if we hope to survive and prosper, and ultimately to truly help the innocence of our planet. Whether we're discussing Roof or Himizu though, there's something to be learned. On that note, I think it's time we close out this dark chapter on a more hopeful note. Himizu is a bleak, unforgiving film. It doesn't pull any punches, nor does it take any joy in its violence. It's one of Shion Sono's most stark films, and it proves that even after what may have been his opus, he's definitely not lost his knack for quality filmmaking. It's not the type of film you should watch when you're super depressed, but then again, in some ways, maybe it is an appropriate time with Himizu, given that it ends with the statement that things can and will get better if only we persevere. That being said, it's important to remember that, like everything we discuss here, Himizu is a film. It's a fictional film, a fantasy more or less. It has some pretty brutal real-world implications, but at the end of the day, it's an allegory, and it should be taken as an inspiration for bettering yourself and the world in which you live, rather than being seen as a guide to life. If you feel like you're a Sumida, and you feel as though you don't have a Keiko in your life who is there to support you through your tough times, go out and find someone. It can be a friend, a counselor, a teacher, a parent, a police officer, a therapist, it doesn't matter. The point is that if you are having issues or violent thoughts, it's better that you talk to someone and that you get help. As Himizu shows us on an abstract level, things will get better. But the most important thing is to want help and to seek it. It's an immensely affecting film for this reason, and we highly recommend it, even among Shion Sono's vast filmography.